All right, good evening everyone and welcome to the Freethinkers of Virginia Tech. Um, tonight we have a presentation meeting with uh, Dr. Minnick. Um, so Dr. Minnick is giving a talk and here's the description he's given. He will recall his experiences in the old Eastern European educational system and will place them in the historical context of the West East Division of Europe during the Cold War. Finally, we'll draw some comparisons and contrasts with the American educational system. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Minnick. All right, well, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, and uh, it's my first time with the uh, free thinkers, even though I've been a free thinker, I guess, from the beginning, <laughs> from conception, from day one. So, uh, okay, so I come from a country that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it used to be called the Socialist Federative Republic of Yugoslavia, and uh, it's broken now into countries that go from Slovenia, that's a member of European Union already, it's a country that borders Italy and Austria on the southern side. Well, it, Austria on the southern side, Italy on the eastern side. And then there's a neighboring country called Croatia, and I think they just joined the uh, European Union. In the middle, there is a country called Bosnia and Herzegovina. And then there is a country where the old capital of Socialist Federal Republic Yugoslavia is Belgrade, where my mom lives. Uh, it's called Bel uh, it's Belgrad, which my city, uh, but translated as Belgrade. That's, that country is called Serbia. There is a sort of disputed area called Kosovo, the southern part of Serbia, and then the last one is called Macedonia. That's the country that borders Greece and Bulgaria. It's north of Greece and west of Bulgaria and east of Albania. Now, when you say Eastern Europe, uh, it's actually uh, not a geographical term. It's a Cold War term. Uh, I guess Cold War officially started probably with the uh, crisis in the division uh, of Germany, occupied Germany after World War II. As you know, the Soviet occupied part basically became the German uh, Democratic Republic, GDR. It doesn't exist anymore, obviously, as unified Germany. Uh, Berlin was divided between the Soviets and the Allies, and the uh, French, uh, American, American was basically around Munich. The southern part, French was towards the French border, and Hamburg and the hotel part was the British part that became the West Germany or Federal Republic. Um, uh, so, uh, so uh, Eastern Europe was basically a designation for the uh, countries that came onto the, uh, the Soviet dominance. They're not Slavic countries, obviously Germany was not. Uh, Poland is another country. If you look at the map of Poland, let's say in 1939 before the war started, you will see, let's say, that the capital today is Lithuania, Vilnius was called in Polish, Vilno was the capital, well, was a place in Poland. Uh, Lviv, uh, today's Ukrainian city in the western part of Ukraine, was called uh, Lvov, uh, and that was a Ukrainian, uh, that was a Polish city, and they were po sort of uh, majority Polish uh, population, whatever. It just got, got completely shifted, basically. Uh, the Soviet Union uh, absorbed the territory, and so now you have Ukrainian territory and Belarus, and of course Lithuania, the capital of Lithuania is Vilnius, and so forth. There was a huge transfer of population. Uh, 12 million Germans were basically from Eastern Europe uh, forced to leave. There was a popular move, movement between the Ukrainians and the Poles, between the Lithuanians and the Poles, between the Slovaks and the Hungarians and so forth. So Polish, uh, Poland definitely is not, if you look at the map of Poland today, you know, you will not recognize historical Poland or the Poland from 1939. South of Poland, another Slavic country, today is two countries, Czech Republic and Slovakia, it was called Czechoslovakia. It was probably the most industrialized country of the region. Uh, and, and then south of that is another non-Slavic country called Hungary. Uh, Hungary lost probably two-thirds of its territory already uh, uh, when Austro-Hungary was defeated and dismantled after World War I. So a huge part of Romania, Transylvania, parts of Slovakia, you know, that's also <coughs> northern part of Serbia. That was all Hungarian. And uh, that little landlocked part was uh, uh, what, what was uh, uh, Hungary in 1945. Um, and then there is the southern part of, hum of uh, south of Hungary is Yugoslavia. And uh, you have east of it is Romania, not, not the Slavic country, Bulgaria, which is uh, Slavic. And then you have south of uh, uh, Yugoslavia, or from that, you know, it was a little bit wedged between the Yugoslavia and the Adriatic Sea, is Albania, again, not a Slavic country. So when people associate Eastern Europe with Slavic countries, they're wrong. Germans, Hungarians, Romanians, and Albanians, not Slavs at all. Uh, so that's one thing. Also, it's not Eastern. 
if you look at the map of Europe, it goes all the way to the Urals. So all the Baltic states, Ukraine, Belarus, and the European part of Russia would be Eastern Europe. This is the central part of Europe, geographically speaking. And let's say the part where I come from would be the south part of the central part. Poland would be, let's say, the center of Europe. So, or, or Czechoslovakia. And uh, the Russians took over in a very interesting way. Uh, all the countries, except for my country, Yugoslavia, uh, were basically uh, implanted by the communists from Moscow. Uh, the communist parties were basically defeated in all the free elections they were held. It was just the opposite of what happened in Italy where CIA basically manufactured the first democratic elections so the communists would, ru would lose. Uh, the communists were much stronger in, in, in France, for example, and in Italy uh, than they were in Eastern Europe. Uh, but you see, uh, a totalitarian uh, 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 regimes operate on a very beautiful uh, level. And I want to talk about the aspect of totalitarianism, which was very useful for me and also for other people, and that's education. Okay, so. Totalitarianism basically works in such a way that you, uh, you, you, you uh, strangle civic uh, societies like groups like this would not be able to exist unless they're part of the Communist Party. Um, uh, YMCA, Boy Scouts, anything like this. You take over radio, okay, so you uh, take over the press. And of course, you have the rule of the police, uh, the Secret Service, everything like this. This was heavily Russian infiltrated. And that's how they took over. So they lost the elections, but they won the elections. Okay, uh, there is another term, right, that is used, and I think it was invented by Winston Churchill, right, that there was an iron curtain that fell basically from north of Stettin, which is a, uh, which is a, uh, a port in the Baltic Sea, in Poland, all the way to Trieste. Trieste at that time was a disputed territory between Italy and Tito's Yugoslavia. And uh, there's a beautiful book written by Anne Applebaum. Anne Applebaum is a historian from London. Uh, she won the Pulitzer Prize, I think, uh, eight years or maybe ten years ago by writing a history of the Gulag, recommended reading. But this is a book that's devoted to the uh, Iron Curtain and basically how this manufacturing of Eastern Europe happened. Now, the interesting thing about Yugoslavia is you see the communists were not transplanted from Moscow. It was a, a, it was a movement that was a homegrown movement that happened during the war. Basically, the largest partisan movement uh, anti-Nazi and the Nazi collaborator, whatever, was organized around this guy who uh, became the leader, and everyone knows his name is uh, Marshal Tito. And uh, he was, I think, a couple of times on the cover of Time during World War II, but so was Joseph Stalin. <laughs> so uh, all of the leaders, of course, of Eastern Europe were called Little Stalins, but the interesting thing about Tito was that, first of all, he controlled his own force. Uh, military force and the police, he didn't need the Soviets, okay? So he didn't have the Soviet troops on the ground. They came in a little bit toward the end of the, uh, the war, but basically they are very easy, you know, he got rid of them, okay? Uh, the other thing is because he was part of the underground movement, for example, the, under, the second largest underground movement in Europe, which was Polish, was totally run by non-communists, mainly Catholics, and actually anti-communists, okay? It's called Home Art and was completely destroyed by the Soviets after World War II. Uh, and, uh, uh, but you see, Tito basically had his own army, so he could run the country, and he had a popular support. Partially, the reason for the popular support is that it's not was just the German occupation, but a horrible civil war that happened between different religious and ethnic fractions, and you saw a repeat of that in the 90s. That was the ending of the thing that stopped, that Tito stopped basically in 1945. Now, because he had his own control, even though uh, he and the people under him were very much uh, uh, in the Stalinist mode, uh, uh, the way this operated was you sort of had some type of democratic elections with other parties. So you wanted to show to the West the continuity of the system that existed between 1939, before, 19, uh, before the war. And then basically the communists took over. So this definitely happened in Yugoslavia. But an interesting thing that happened was the following. In 1948, as you know, Truman instituted this doctrine of the help of the Western Europe, right, to uh, give huge infusion of funds so that people who were basically in a completely ravaged continent would not fall prey to the left-wing agitators, right, and basically communists. And, uh, and that as a response of that, uh, Stalin instituted something which was called the uh, uh, common form. 
basically it was like the revival of the Communist International, but it was like the Communist Informational Bureau, which was, uh, uh, and all these countries were part um, of it. Uh, and uh, remember, at that time, also part of Austria was occupied, and part of Vienna was Soviet as well. And it was not clear until 1955 whether they would go east or there would be a partition of, of Austria and sort of eastern and western Austria at that time. Anyway, so what happened with Tito is he joined this movement and then basically became independent. In other words, he uh, got into a fight with Stalin and said, like, you will not tell me what to do. Because, you know, I have my army, I have my people, I control my police. It was impossible for the Hungarians or any of these people, East Germans, to say, because they came from Moscow. They survived the purges. These communists survived the purges. And that's an amazing feat. <laughs> Okay, because most communists were killed by Stalin, actually, international, in the 30s. And so, uh, so these guys survived, and they were really bureaucratic, toe the line, everything that comes from Moscow, they would follow. Now, what happened with Yugoslav communists, they basically uh, left communist form. And this is one of the first cracks that happens in the Iron Curtain. And usually when you see the Iron Curtain, it kind of goes all the way to Yugoslavian border, and maybe goes the other way. Because kind of Tito formed a system which was a one-party communist rule system, but it was not aligned with Moscow. Another thing that happened is when NATO was formed, so when Marshall Far uh, uh, Plan was instituted, Stalin came up with common form. In 1955, when NATO was formed, uh, well, Stalin was dead, he died in 1953, but Khrushchev, or uh, uh, people who followed, essentially, uh, uh, Khrushchev basically instituted what's called the Warsaw Pact. And again, if you look at the encyclopedias and the borders of the Warsaw Pact, you're not going to find Yugoslavia there. Still, it was part of that, how should I say, view of the world. What's that world of the view? And actually, my parents, both being communists, um, my father was basically, you know, was born in 1934. So, you know, during the war, he was young, but after the war, he was very enthusiastic and with 16 or 17 years old, immediately joined the party and so forth. And that was that um, it, it's, it's very much as you look at any monotheistic religion. There is sort of a brighter future. Uh, you build, you work for that future. Uh, it's, it's very optimistic, it's very hopeful, uh, but it's not critical, okay? It's definitely not free, it's not skeptical. Uh, it was called, uh, it was the, the philo official philosophy behind this rule was something which is called dialectical materialism or scientific materialism. But the problem with this is that lots of aspects of science uh, were not present there. And you have to become a scientist, like, you know, uh, and, and to know really what this means. And that is basically that you can criticize any opinion, uh, that there is a free exchange of information, uh, that there is no guideline from anyone. Well, in a communist system, this was not possible. Except that Tito also made a, a, a kind of a deviation there. So in some sense, he was a benign totalitarian. Of course, or benevolent. Uh, uh, he dealt with people who opposed with him very brutally, okay? Uh, but once he got, uh, as, uh, you know, he, he, he had power in his hands, uh, uh, in some sense, he allowed things that basically were, you could not ever dream that this was allowed anywhere in the Soviet, I mean, Soviet Union or in the Warsaw Pact. So Yugoslavia was always treated by these people, let's say, by Romanian friends, Hungarian friends, the Polish friends, until the, the breakup of communism, as this wonder, because, for example, you could travel. There was no way you could leave the Warsaw Pact, get a passport or travel. I mean, you could emigrate, but all right, no returning back. You could travel, you could work outside. There was a, lots of Gastarbeiters, the guest workers in Germany, they came from Yugoslavia doing all sorts of things. Then they would go back. Tito saw that it was economically beneficial. Okay, the borders were open to foreigners. Okay, now it is true, I hear from my American friends, for example, European friends, when they would come and visit Yugoslavia, let's say, in the 70s and 80s. Tito died basically 79, 80, I forget now, but around that time, maybe 1980. And, uh, <clears throat> Let's say if they would take photographs or something that looked vaguely associated with the military, with the police, then someone would approach them. So, so they were, they were, right, there was a spirit of totalitarianism there. But on the other hand, it was not like, you know, you would be put somewhere, all right? Or, or that there was no traffic, no influence from, from outside, or you could not leave the country or anything like that. So it was a strange mix of something which looked like a one-party system, Right, not socialism in the sense that Sweden and Norway are socialists. 
Sweden and Norway are the only socialist countries in the world. <laughs> These are pseudo-socialist countries. These are countries that had maybe an idea, but they didn't have the means. First of all, they were not wealthy, like Sweden and Norway. The population was not maybe as uniform. Um, uh, it just the preconditions for having progressive, open, socialist society just simply was not there. Now, you also have to understand that after World War II in Western Europe, right, pretty much everyone wanted a welfare state. The man who invented the uh, phrase Iron Curtain lost the election. Here is this uh, war hero, Winston Churchill. He loses to labor. The same thing happened in France, happened in Italy. And that's why various parties, kind of from the right, but they were open to the welfare state, to some type of version, capitalist version of socialism, if you can call it that way, right, usually called Christian parties or Christian democratic parties were established whether in Italy or, for example, in, uh, in Germany. Um, OK, it's a little bit different, Britain or France and so forth, but they were present, or, or in Nordic countries as well. And uh, so there's this kind of uh, interesting uh, fusion of Christ, uh, 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 Christian ideals with socialist, the Christian socialist, obviously very strong social democratic movement that existed even before uh, the takeover of Eastern Europe by the Soviets. Now, in this totalitarian society, you might say, like, okay, everything is restricted. Like, you read the newspapers or you watch, let's say, we had two programs. Okay, you maybe had, I don't know, ABC, NBC, CBS. There was a couple other ones in the old days, right? But, uh, I mean, you might, we might argue today, do you have actually free press even here, right? Because if it's controlled only by a couple of people and so forth, you don't really have press. But with the internet or whatever, maybe you might say you have access to that information. This was, of course, before uh, that age. And, uh, and uh, you know, so you might say, like, everything you would listen to, it was kind of manufactured. Uh, you know, you would take the opposite statement of what you read, and basically that was the truth. Maybe true in the Soviet, in the Warsaw Pact, in Yugoslavia, it was kind of hard to determine, right? What was true, what was this? It was kind of colored, partially because of this amorphous way Tito conducted affairs. Now, totalitarianism did have one benefit all over Eastern Europe. And that, of course, happened over the history. If you look at Jesuits and how they influenced the educational system, or whatever, you know, or I don't know, the Chinese Mandarin system. Whenever you have basically one person who tells you, or a group of people telling you, this is how what you're going to learn, okay, you can actually benefit from it if it's done right. Okay, so let me tell you basically how the education will organize, because you know, I have two kids who are Americans now. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel so sorry for them. Like I feel sorry for most of the students that encounter you. <laughs> okay, but uh, well, let me tell you what, what this is, uh, okay? I'm not saying that this is the ideal educational system because there are counter examples of this. If you go to a system, let's say, American is kind of related, uh, Anglo, uh, Anglo system is Anglo-American, where basically you don't put too much control of things, but people just go on their own, and you know, if they're interested, they will do it. If they're not, okay, well, you know. So it's like an open, free, minimalist system, uh, uh, laissez fair in education. Go on. This one was not. First of all, we don't have, we didn't have any choice. Okay, the first grade you start first and the second grade. You had uh, six subjects. Okay, and uh, uh, of course you have to wear, wear uniforms and so forth. And I'm talking about every school. I didn't go to any special schools all the way to high school. I will tell you, I went to something like special math education. But it was in a small city south of Belgrade. It was not the you know, special school that you only find in the capital of your country, okay? So it was something that you would find in many, many places around Yugoslavia. So first grade that you are, first and second grade, you have six, exam uh, six uh, and you're graded. You're graded. You come in as a six-year-old, and you're never tell told that you're brilliant, brilliant or that everything you do is a great job. And then they give you a little star, <laughs> three stars, maybe five stars, okay? Everyone is a nice thing. No. You are basically, you know, immediately compared to other kids. They're real grades, okay? You have a mathematics, you have the super creation, you had a knowledge of nature and society, okay? That will be split in many subjects later on. You had your music, you had your art, and you had a physical education, the first two years. You also had a bunch of books that you had to read and write essays on. You're learning how to read and write, and you have to write an essay on a book. We had six in the first grade. Okay, it would be 20 by the 12th grade that I had to write an essay on. And I was just mathematically, technically minded, okay? Not even going into the language uh, you know, orientation, okay? So the third grade, what happens is basically that this knowledge of nature and society gets split into two, okay? Knowledge of nature, knowledge of society, okay? 
Uh, then in the fifth grade, you get your uh, foreign language. The most popular was English, not Russian. Then German, French, maybe Russian. Uh, my mom, her generation, she had to basically take also uh, old languages, like Latin. Okay, I didn't have to take Latin. And I definitely didn't have to take Greek. Uh, so, so basically what happened with the knowledge of nature, uh, knowledge, of his, uh, knowledge of society got split into history and geography. And by geography, I also mean a little bit of geology. Um, you know, I have to read the encyclopedia to my son to tell him like how the earth is built and so forth, because no one is going to tell him. Okay. Now, I have to tell you, this is a second world country. What do I mean by that? You know, the first statement that you can read about the United States, I read in the encyclopedia, is like the United States is the wealthiest, the most powerful country in the world. Right? We definitely didn't live in the wealthiest, most powerful country in the world. So, for example, if you go to, to uh, your... Uh, uh, typical classroom. In a typical classroom, you're not going to find smart boards, computers, and all these things that, let's say, American kids would have today. And definitely they had in the fifth or, let's say, the 70s, uh, other gimmicks compared to us. Right? Very Spartan, very theoretical, very book-based. Okay? Because there's basically no money for investing into anything else. Okay? So, uh, uh, but again, you know, great days, uh, very competitive. Uh, in the, uh, uh, you start, you, in the fifth grade, when you started you know, your history and geography slash maybe geology, if you want, you also started the foreign languages, but you also started something which was how things work. In other words, a course in technology. They went fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Uh, I don't know, how does the internal combustion engine work? How does the radio work? How does the TV work? How do you make a photograph? How, you know. I mean, things like that, all right? Then in the seventh grade, the knowledge of nature that continued to the fifth and sixth grade got split into three. And that was physics, biology, and chemistry. Okay, and let me tell you, uh, this continued because, for example, I have biology, chemistry, and physics, seventh and eighth grade, then what you would call ninth and tenth, then I continued physics, tenth and eleventh, but I also had chemistry and whatever, third of high school, right? So I basically had five years of chemistry, five years of biology, and six years of physics. And this is how it was organized. The first lecture on biology is theory of evolution. Now there's a very interesting ideological kink here. See, Marx was a great admirer of Darwin. Okay? And so in some sense, the theory of evolution of Darwin was, was a, a absorbed by this official philosophy which is called dialectic of materialism. But if you went into the Soviet Union, okay, they actually believed <laughs> into something which would be some form of law markism. I mean, it would be, uh, let's say we mold Dan over there over the next 30 years and we get a new Soviet man. It doesn't have anything to do with natural selection. That's why quacks like Lysenko who was basically this guy who didn't even know any biology, completely destroyed biology as a science because he was a friend of Stalin and he could tell him like, well, you know, I'm going to get you crops because, you know, I'm going to plant this and this and, uh, you know, and that is going to give a new crops and it's going to be something incredible. You can believe in genetics. It's interesting, like, Lysenko would be mentioned as, uh, you know, with laughter, okay, by our teacher of biology. And I always wonder, well, of course, in hindsight, I have to worry, like, is this because it's ideological, right? Because you knew that we were opposed to Stalin, let's say it was close to Stalin, right? Or is it basically for some genuine sort of scientific uh, reason? So definitely the theory of evolution from the beginning. It was a totally atheistic system. I didn't even know that there was a concept of religion growing up. Now, of course, when you look at your grandparents or something like this, you find out that they had some... Uh, funny, let's say, uh, customs, but they would never impose anything on us because they knew both of my parents who were communists. Okay? So at some point when you became conscious, you wanted to explore and see, like, what is that thing that is forbidden? All right. So, you know, uh, probably I read most of these uh, basic things, the Torah or the Gospels or, you know, the Quran or anything like this or uh, Tao Te Ching or whatever, you know, it's like all these basic things. And, uh, well, <laughs> apart from some philosophy and some poetry, it didn't illuminate me much. So the, the scientific system, in some sense, was already uh, enough, at least for me, uh, whatever was presented in, in this kind of ideologically based 
uh, uh, society, that it was enough, you know, to uh, distinguish between something that is plausible and something that's totally implausible. However, if you go back to these countries today, <laughs> with all the successes of education, you were saying, you will find out that even in their very dire economic straits, okay, they will uh, invest money not in their education uh, schools that are compared to what they used to be, nothing, okay, but they would build new churches because that causes culture, tradition, and things like that. Okay, it just tells you something about the human nature. Um, okay, so basically now we come uh, to, to high school where everything was ramped up. Uh, uh, we did have to take some ridiculous things by maybe American standards. I mean, for example, I knew at one point the uh, data about the American nuclear arsenal, but also the Soviet one, because we had to take two years of civic defense. Yeah, the nuclear war was a, uh, uh, a reality that will happen anytime. As a matter of fact, it can happen tomorrow. <laughs> you know, people forget about this, but you know, it can happen anytime. Uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know, at that time it was, you know, there was more hype about it. It was more in the press, uh, uh, there was this tension between the West and the East and so forth, and somehow, right, we were in the middle or in between. As a matter of fact, at some point Tito took this kind of third option, right, this Popperian third world or whatever, and he uh, started with people like Nasser and Nehru, uh, um, Nekrumah and people like that, the uh, uh, non-alignment movement. And then that was completely hijacked by Cuba and so forth, so it's different. But it was started in the 60s not as a communist movement, but it was basically you know, third world countries, even though maybe Yugoslavia was a second world country. I mean, we had running water and things like that, plumbing or whatever, as opposed to some very, very poor places. Um, okay, so you get to high school, and uh, you get this civ uh, civic defense <laughs> where you learn how to uh, uh, throw bombs and uh, how to shoot uh, uh, light munition. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and then you will learn ridiculous facts about, I don't know, the Soviet arsenal, the US arsenal, the NATO arsenal, the uh, whatever, Warsaw Pact arsenal. It's crazy stuff that, of course, I forgot. It's, it's relevant, but I don't know if this trained the memory or any which way, but I can remember lots of things, especially bizarre things in physics, uh, and it, it's possible that I got these sort of mnemonic devices because I was learning bizarre things that I forgot, right? the things that I don't really care about. There was also the beginning of philosophy. Okay, first, second, third, and fourth year of high school, we had philosophy. We had a history of philosophy starting, it was all Western based, right? It's all Western based, very Eurocentric, starting with Greeks, going all the way. But in some sense, it was um, predestined. I guess the Protestants would use that, right? It was predestined to go into Marxism, which was the peak of everything. <laughs> <laughs> but on the way, right, to Marxism, you learned lots of things. Like, for example, we had to read Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations. Because Adam Smith and David Ricardo, all these scotching, Economists have been taken as a precursor of Marxist thought, the economics, you know, of capitalism and things like that, or the German idealistic philosophy, Kant, Hegel. You have to because you know, in some sense, Marx came out as a Hegelian, but sort of materialistic version of Hegel, right? Uh, and so, and so this was interesting. At some point, I think this uh, uh, subject became more of a sociology. Uh, I think the third and fourth year. So it had a dimension of philosophy, but also had a dimension of sociology. Now, to tell you something about the Tito system is, you see, we were allowed to read things that would not be allowed uh, in, uh, in the Soviet Union. For example, one of the books that we had to report was Waiting for Godot. Definitely not a beacon of Marxism. Okay, And this was allowed to be played on stage in Belgrade in the early 50s. I don't think this was allowed anywhere in the West, in Eastern. Okay. Now, it's interesting also that some of the avant-garde theater was a social <coughs> communist. As you know, Bertolt Brecht, you know, who spent lots of years in California after leaving Nazi, uh, Nazi Germany, he worked for Hollywood and so forth. Here is your working communist in the United States. Uh, when East Germany was formed, he actually went to Berlin and formed the famous uh, Berlin uh, theater group. And, but to see, I mean, he would be taken as one of these modernists. I don't know, you watch Tony Kushner or something like this. For me, that's Bertolt Brecht, just the American version. Okay. 
done. You know, when, when I when I see that just in America, it's like okay, this is just Bertolt Brecht just applied to New York and the United States. Anyway, so uh, so definitely there was this leniency there. Now in the third year, what happens is that people were divided by whatever their talents or whatever grades you had and what whatever subjects you had. And so what happened is that my math subjects got split into the following. I had calculus, I had ordinary differential equations, I had probability statistics, I had mathematical logic, I had linear programming, I had ordinary programming, I had the geometry, I had linear algebra, I had descriptive geometry, I had projective geometry, on and on and on. Okay, lots of math subjects. I actually would have 16 hours at least of math in the third and fourth year. And by standards of America, when I look, for example, what people study in the first, second, I would say third year as a math majors. <laughs> what can I say? Now, this also tells you that you can train people a lot more. And by the way, this was totally centralized. I'm not talking about the governor school for talented kids or Bronx School of Science. Okay? This is basically you go to any place. Okay, and if it's a city or something, maybe you don't go to a village, but you go to a city where there is a school, enough students and so forth, and you can do this. And they work, it's coming from neighboring villages to our little town, right south of Belgrade, right where you know, this was possible. The teachers had to have their degrees in the subject, as opposed to having just two years of general physics, okay, and then they teach physics and maybe also coach. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe they do you know, they actually get a degree in physics. So they had quantum mechanics. They had atomic nuclear physics part of, you know. They didn't have as much as the researchers because they were in that sort of uh, direction of edu being educators. But they get a real degree in physics. Okay. Now when you get to college, which is the last part that I want to compare here, because you see this is an amazing thing that happens here, as opposed to my experience, educational experiences. Uh, I'm not advocating because, you know, in some sense, you know, I learned too much. And, uh, but you see, you learn for life. Okay, where here you don't learn enough, and then you have to catch up the whole life. And maybe you never catch up, okay, depending on if you care or not. But that's in some sense the only consistent. Uh, you know, you know, if you go to Oxford, they don't ask you to go and I don't know attend lectures, but you know, you maybe tutor, and maybe every week you will write an essay. So you could write, you could invite some faculty members because we have a faculty members in physics, right? Who both undergraduate, graduates in Oxford, so they can actually tell you the whole story. Uh, but so it, I'm not saying that this system is better than the other, but you see, the fact that I got the review of literature of the Western world, at least, or philosophy, together with mathematics and physics, and of course, I forgot to tell you at some point I also had astronomy <laughs> with, with physics and so forth, that I would have other sciences, but also humanities. I mean, I had lots of years of history. I had sociology, you know? I had philosophy, right? And whether you want to say that it was biased or not, that I had to read, I don't know, uh, and I did. I, I read lots of stuff from Lenin, believe it or not, and I cannot believe that I actually did because it's very bad writing. <laughs> okay, but I had to, I had to read this. But we also read Camus. Oh, Sartre. Okay, which is a totally different thing. Now you might say like, well, yeah, okay, Sartre was also ideological. Well, Camus is not. I mean, he was, I think, uh, open-minded and, and whatnot. And then the other thing, the atmosphere was that, let's say, people could write books about the Gulag, where you know Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir did not even believe this. Now, this did happen in the 70s, I think. You see, this is a, there's always a time for everything, right? It didn't happen in the 60s. But it was basically happening around at the same time as Solzhenitsyn was, let's say, coming out in Russia and so forth, and all this gulag literature. It would basically happen in Yugoslavia. A great exponent of that was Danilo Kish. And I think there is a new book I just published in this country about this remarkable writer. Anyway, so uh, 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 what happens here is that you don't have between K, K twelve to, K to twelve to me seems like kindergarten, <laughs> <laughs> high level kindergarten here. It seems very free. Uh, it, there are beautiful aspects of it. Of course, first of all, uh, you have a lot more gimmicks. That we, I mean, I had programming. We never had a computer. 
the only computer my friend who now uh, lives in Miami had was this Texas Instrument, and I forget which one Texas Instrument. We remember we programming it to invert matrices. It took it a whole night. Then there was a Sinclair ZX. I don't even, you guys don't remember, but maybe older members of the audience will remember Sinclair ZX. I mean, this is before the first Mac, okay? And so what you basically did is I learned a lot of uh, <laughs> hexadecimals. <laughs> Okay, so you really learn how the machine works. Okay, so old style programming, you can go way back with, I guess, von Neumann or people like that who were thinking in, in, in uh, that way. So, uh, so yeah, you don't have the gimmicks, you don't also have distractions, uh, right? All sorts of activities that you can go to. There was very little choice. The only pre uh, subject that I could choose was basically happened in my fifth year of college. Everything else before that time. And, you know, I basically had 10 subjects per year in college, like around 50 subjects for five years, plus I had to write a diploma work. Okay, I had three years of mathematics, even though I was an electrical engineer. Okay, three years of, of, of mathematics. It was a three years of general physics, plus all the other physics that physicists get. Plus, of course, your engineering subjects. Motors, telecommunications, uh, you name it. Circuits, what? Okay, if you ask me now, lots of this stuff, I go, forgotten, obviously, I've forgotten, right? If you don't practice this, uh, you forget. But of course, does it give you some type of feel that, you know, if someone mentioned, I don't know, the other day it was a colloquium, someone mentioned a, a paper by Moore or Shannon, and I knew that paper about how to build a reliable thing from unreliable components. a very famous paper for electrical engineering, right? But, you know, you take a generic physicist in America, if they know about this, probably not. Okay, so you would know you have this breadth of knowledge and also breadth of interest, and this could be a curse and this could be a bonus. And I think uh, I sort of always struggle with these two things. Now, what happens, of course, is the American college system and especially American graduate system. There was no graduate school there. Okay, and I came to graduate school here 25 years ago. Okay, is simply without comparison in the world, and I'm not patting anyone on the back. But basically, American universities, their wealth, uh, the research that's done, the quality of people involved, the results produced, the, it's just overwhelming. So when you get to graduate school, there's absolutely no comparison. But you see, it starts basically from nowhere. K to 12 is total vacuum. College gets much, much better, depending where you are, right? There is this difference in between the Ivies and the biggest states and then whatever, right? So there is this definitely, the, there is this uh, 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 hierarchy, right? And, uh, and then the graduate schools, of few of you uh, big research universities, so far, pretty much I don't think it matters much, Ivy's or big state universities, so forth. They're all ex extremely, extremely good. Whereas something like that simply did not exist over there. There were no facilities. The people were not in the field. You know, to get scientists or to get humanists or anything like this, you need a critical number of people. People are isolated. I mean, you can read until you get blue in your face. You know, all sorts of things. But the question is, what will you produce? Who will you interact with, right? There is no community, there was no connection, right? So partially it was the lack of funds, partially is basically the fact that they were isolated and so forth. And lots of people, especially if they were good in college, of course, came here like, you know, they come uh, elsewhere to, uh, to this unique system. So it's an interesting comparison, right? Vacuum something very good and something exceptional, right? Where you have something pretty exceptional. I would say I, I have this phenomenal memories, and especially of high school. The stuff that I learned there uh, from nuclear, non nuclear I mean, you know, and that the, the, I would, I mean, the first class in chemistry starts, periodic table is based on quantum theory. <laughs> <laughs> quantum theory is a Schrodinger equation. What's a Schrodinger equation? So I go and buy a book on quantum theory. And then I struggle and so forth. Someone didn't want to, and they just learned what was written in chemistry books. And the chemistry books, biology books, or whatever, they were written by real professionals. Okay, this would come, I don't know, maybe not from the Academy of Science, right? Because there are so many Academy of Sciences for each of these countries that now exist, right? <coughs> but it would come from some centralized place where people knew what they were talking about, and they wanted for some reason to transplant all this huge knowledge to, uh, to, to young people, right? So you had excellent textbooks and you had excellent teachers. 
And uh, you know, if you were lucky to have also uh, good classmates. The other thing, the system was very competitive. You probably heard about Olympics and physics and math and so forth. All of this stuff, it started in Eastern Europe. It was a great tradition that existed in Hungary even before communism and in Poland and, and then of course the Soviet Union and so forth. And at, at some point they just ruled. Of course then once the communist system went down, uh, okay, it's a, it's a different story now. So we were always competing in something, uh, whether it's history or math or physics, I even competed in poetry or things like that. Always these outlets. These what you would call clubs, but there was nothing like this. Okay, that if, if it was something like a free thinker, uh, eyebrows would be raised. This would be me. Are you challenging something, our system, or what not? Right? And uh, so from one side, I have these remarkable memories of this phenomenal educational system that basically, you know, gave me the life of the mind, right? But then on the other hand, I think I benefited from the other one. Right, which is at the critical junction where I think people got frustrated with the one-party system, even of the Tito side, which is basically when, you, when you're in your 20s, right? when you're full of life and you're looking for opportunities, and then you find walls. I think there people would find walls, whether they're professional or, or otherwise. Uh, uh, here, the transition here was fantastic because I'm getting from excellent to excellent. <laughs> so in some sense, I had uh, best of both worlds. And it's amazing to me how these structures operate that on one side, that they are totally complementary, right? As I, everything that I remember is great. It basically goes all the way to high school and then something in college. But at that time, you could not be competitive with best colleges here. There's, there's no way, okay? All right, and then the graduate school was simply non-existent. The research was very haphazard, right? Whereas uh, uh, here, you know, got into uh, into the best possible system. Now, Soviet Union, of course, was very different. But remember, Soviet Union was extremely biased to certain disciplines. Biology was completely dis destroyed for ideological reasons. Math and physics survived for very anecdotal reasons. Math and physics, especially physics, quantum and relativity, unlike in Nazi Germany, where they were labeled Jewish science, in Soviet Union, they were labeled capitalist science anti-Marxist. So at some point, uh, they were almost to be destroyed, except the man who was the analog of Oppenheimer in Soviet Union, the man with a big beard, Kurchatov was his name, who was in charge of building the Soviet atomic bomb, uh, talked to Beria, who is this crazy guy in charge of the Secret Service, a really murderous individual, uh, very close to Stalin. And uh, Beria wanted to get, uh, start getting rid of physicists like he was getting rid of biologists. And uh, Kurchatov told him, well, it's very simple like this. Okay? Without relativity and quantum theory, there's no nuclear reactions. Without nuclear reactions, there's no atomic bomb. Common and Beria. So you choose. <laughs> <laughs> and in some sense, these become the disciplines which Soviets really, truly excel. And I've read many, many books. I never studied Russian, but you know the proximity of, let's say, civil creation to Russian is such that you can very easily read. I still have the books. I mean, for example, Final Lectures of Physics, I read when I was in high school, and they were in Russian. And they were broken in little, like, it's not three big books, Final Lectures of Physics, but uh, uh, they were, I don't know, nine books or something broken into various volumes. And, you know, paper would be, I don't know, a little bit of white paper, then they run out of white paper, then they have a little bit of yellow paper, then they run out of yellow paper, a little bit of green paper, right? So the presentation was not that great, but it was very cheap, it was available, you could purchase it, uh, and uh, so yeah, that was my connection with, uh, with the Soviet system. But otherwise, it was very uh, uh, different. So, okay, I'm gonna stop here. I think I talked too much, probably more than, I said, did I say 30 or 40 minutes? 30 minutes, 40. 30 to 40. Okay, okay. well, so maybe I over, okay. So let's, uh, let's have some questions and discussion now. What yes. was the schedule for a normal day of high school? Ah, as I tell my daughter, who just started like school high, uh, it was work, work, and work. I mean, not to, uh, you know, Lenin had this uh, fame. You know, Lenin had everything, formula for everything. Like socialism was electrification plus industrialization. You know, whatever. Uh, so he would always say study, 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 right? But basically, that's how it was. So if you were first and second grade, you would have to go early. Let's say you start at seven, 
right, and go all the way. Uh, you see, when I say all these exams, here in America, right, I see with my daughter, she has, let's say, eight classes, and she actually has to take eight classes every day, mm -hmm. right? There, uh, there was no equality between classes. Math ruled. <laughs> Simply rule. Okay, so they have exactly the same fraternity that the French and the English of the Oxbridge uh, Cambridge system have. That if you teach someone mathematics, they can run you know, some corner of the empire, if it was in the British Empire, or yeah, they can be a civil servant in the French system, whether they're going to run a factory or they're going to be an engineer or whatever. You see, it's like the training for the mind. There was the same prejudice. I mean, there's no, I mean, I don't think we have data, neuroscientific data for this, but there's something about mathematics. First of all, you can teach them, teach mathematics starting from a very young age. Like you can teach music and languages and so forth, right? I mean, this sort of experience that goes way back uh, up to the Middle Ages or something like this. And then, and, but you see, but then you, you, you should ramp it up. You constantly ramp it up, okay? Ramp it up with the number of problems. First of all, every single subject that I have, and that's how I teach over here, people know. I teach London and Lifshitz, which is basically a Soviet system. I always teach, uh, uh, you see, you have to have, for each book that you have, you should have a problem book. Okay, so basically the publishers here are selling you a raw deal. See, if you don't have a problem book that accompanies the book, or student, an, a, an actual other book. These books, the, the, the problems that are given at the end of the chapter or something like this, they are sometimes arbitrary or whatever. There has to be a problem book because absolutely everything you do, you have to do through problems. Okay, now of course you might say like, what about language or philosophy? Well, you write essays. You write all the time. They ask you to write every week. They don't care if you are gonna be math or engineer or something like this. Everyone has to write. Okay, and so then after that becomes automatic. You see, certain procedures of thought manipulation become automatic, <coughs> like the scales. Okay, you recognize the key and you say, okay, I'll go in that key. Okay, so this is basically what I, I, I very consider this education very Pavlovian. Okay, also you were never praised. I, I, yeah, I was like, not so stupid. <laughs> Not so stupid. That's a praise. Okay? But it goes worse. Okay? Uh, it could get very abusive uh, as well. Not physically, but, you know, some people would not take it. All right? Because the professors definitely had, uh, you know, it was, it was a pyramid structure, exactly like the society. You know, it was the pyramid structure in the education. I'm not, I'm not encouraging that, but that's how it was. So the typical day is you go through all these things where math rules and have these other subjects. You come back, you maybe eat some lunch and whatever, and then you work homework on all of these things and tests. I remember, I, I tell my students sometimes, I remember one year I had 120 tests in math. <laughs> you can compute this how it is per day. Okay, you also asked in class to your oral exam. The teacher just says like, okay, because I have, I know two names here, Dan and Zach. Zach! Okay, it's so Zachary Lewis, okay? And, okay, can you tell me about the kidney, please? Maybe not with the please. <laughs> okay, and, and that's how it goes. That's a biology, let's say, for example, fourth year of high school where we learn about the human body and so on. Okay, or um, otherwise you go in front of the board. Physics problem, math problem, chemistry or something like that. Okay, go in front of the board. So it was much more aggressive on the student from the teacher's side, right? It was not interactive in the sense like, we did organize clubs, our own clubs. There was a Nikola Tesla club, you know, how else would you call it? Uh, you know, it's, uh, and we met basically over the weekend, and we would do things like uh, anything that has to do with electricity and magnetism and engineering and whatnot, okay? Uh, but it was not forced upon us. Uh, the teachers, if you were to go to competitions, they would have, and that's the extracurricular activity, by the way. Because you're staying, okay, for the math club, we are preparing for the competitions, regional competitions, you're staying after class. Oh, I have a little lunch. You'll eat later. 
okay? And so, yeah, it's basically, you know, I don't know, TV, uh, cartoons, I had 7.15 in the evening to 7.30 before the first, the second, uh, uh, it was called the uh, uh, daily. Like 30 minutes of news and, you know, one guy shows up and says, like, um, you know, I don't know, news from Washington or, you know, that another guy shows up and news from <coughs> France. It was much more international, by the way. You know, I, I remember opening up the newspapers, which I used to read religiously there, stopped when I got here. Uh, because they were very local and parochial here. Unless you read maybe the New York Times. I mean, uh, I was used to the news where it starts with the world. And because it starts with the world, you feel you're part of the world. One of the things that you don't feel in America is that you're part of the world. How would you feel part of the world if you had never heard about the world? <laughs> right? So you see, if you don't have a feeling that you are right, I mean, this is always uh, that's the thing. If I tell you, for example, oh, everything is about the individual, it's for you, and so forth. Okay, the only community that you have if you go to church, or maybe some other club, or something like that, or something like this. But let's say you're not part, you don't have a service for the country. I had to serve for a year in the military. I'm not saying you have to serve in the military, but aren't you part of some country? I know it's an arbitrary entity that came out of some historical process. But you know, at least, you know, they're giving you protection. <laughs> All right? I mean, you know, it's like, so what are you doing? What are you giving back? <laughs> what are you giving back? So if you don't give back and you don't know how Chicago looks or Washington, D.C., or never been to an inner city neighborhood, or anything like, I don't know if you can call yourself an American, or even Virginian or something like this. You are Blitzborgian or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, this is what, what, what I'm saying. Like, I mean, it's, 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 it's like, to, to do this, I mean, you have to read about the, the stuff, or you have to be exposed. Like in geography, that was precisely that. I, I, I tell my kids, like, when I was six years old, probably, or seven years old, or, uh, I knew all the capitals of all the countries around the world. I probably don't know them now. <laughs> okay, and partially the reason for that was because there was this insistence, right, in class and so forth. There was this map, and someone goes about this and points to some place. Yeah, but if you never heard about Uruguay, Euro what? <laughs> you know, what's that? What's that? So you don't have any connection. So that's the thing. I mean, definitely in the news, you would definitely get international news more, and then you would get something which was pretty soporific. Communist speech is it's pretty, pretty suffering. But yeah, basically work a lot, a lot. <laughs> Going to school, work a lot. Uh, uh, yes, there were, there was playing. You know, there was, you know, going and playing soccer or whatever. You know, it's not, you don't have uh, any, any freedom for play. Yes, you do, but uh, there was also a lot of work and definitely a lot of homework and a lot of testing. Lots of study. I just remember studying a lot. So, yeah. So, how was the social atmosphere different than the social atmospheres in high schools in America? Well, I've never been to high school in America, but now I'm watching a person <laughs> very close to me going through this. And of course, my, my wife is American, so she told me all these things. And um, uh, so, as I understand from not first hand experience, it is very much a social experience. And especially high school seems to be the time for social life. Uh, uh, did people fall in love with each other or have? Yes, they did. Because, you know, hormones uh, and hormonal change is universal, right? <laughs> it, uh, it doesn't depend on the system. But, uh, but uh, definitely uh, yeah, there was no time <laughs> for doing things that I that I hear, you know, American students do in high school. And because they have so much time. And, you know, I've watched a lot of American, uh, you know, coming of age films, which is sort of these high school things and whatever. And it's a special time in, in someone's life, but I have to see it's, it's a lot of how sort of drifting of, you know, the, there was this film from Austin where my wife where I grew up, it's a uh, slacker. And I'm like, yeah, it's like, okay, well, you know, yeah, let's go. Spend some time with some guy, let's go to the cafe, let's drink coffee, let's go down, let's drive. There's a big deal about driving. Come on. To have a car in high school? Crazy. 
<laughs> You'd be lucky to have a car later on. Right? <laughs> I mean, so, uh, so I, I learned to drive when I got here. Okay, so yes, the fact that you're mobile, that you can hop in your car and drive whatever you want or something like this, yeah, definitely changes the dynamics. Yes, the we're going to do uh, breaking the screen. Yes, you want to so. uh, do the uh, yeah. uh, breaking. Okay. All right, let's uh, give our speaker, Dr. Minnick, a round of applause.